We need as a community to become better storytellers, I think, and find ways to engage and inspire people about uh, the need for action. Hi, uh, Marco here from Paralands, and today I have the pleasure to talk with Oliver Steeds. Uh, thank you for taking the time to chat with us. So, you are the founder and mission director of Mecton Ocean Research Institute, is that right? Yes, and yes, good morning, happy new year, it's good to see you. Happy new year, thank you. Um, so, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at Necton and what does Necton do? So Necton is a marine research organization. We're a non-profit, an NGO. Our mission is to accelerate our scientific understanding and protection of the ocean. We were founded five years ago. So this year, the UN Decade for Ocean Science, our five-year anniversary. And what we are, the focus of our work is in the Indian Ocean currently. Um, we're, and the reason we're focusing on the Indian Ocean is because it is the, the least known, the least researched uh, ocean on the planet and also the least protected. Um, and there are currently 2.7 billion people living in and around the Indian Ocean. And uh, by 2050, because of the demographic makeup, half of the world's population are going to be living in and around the Indian Ocean. So how the Indian Ocean changes in the coming years is going to, be, is going to dramatically affect the lives and livelihoods of billions and billions of people. Um, the Indian Ocean is, is warming faster than, uh, than, than most other oceans. It's thought to be warming three times faster than the, than the Pacific Ocean, for example. Um, wow. And it's creating a, uh, what's called the Indian Ocean Dipole, which is a, um, similar to El Nino or La Nina, a, a climate uh, system, a climate event, which uh, is increasing the, uh, the intensity and the frequency of, uh, of climate events uh, in the region. And that's why we're seeing... Over the last 18 months and two years, we've seen the bushfires in Australia, the flooding in India and Indonesia, and the droughts in southern Africa, all related to this climate system in the Indian Ocean. So our focus there is to, is to explore and protect the Indian Ocean and try and build the resilient that's, resilience that's needed to uh, support the lives and livelihoods of billions of people that live around there. Oh yeah, that, that sounds so massive. Um, and yeah, one of my questions would have been like, um you know, why you guys picked the Indian Ocean, but uh, you, you, you really um, explained it well. I was curious, why is that so that the Indian Ocean in, in um, specific is the least researched, the least protected? Is there a reason for that? Yes, I mean, I think it's historical. I mean, as you go back down to the first expeditions, the first major science expedition, which uh, was the, uh, the Challenger expeditions of the 1870s, um, even back in those days, the, you know, that vessel, that mission went around the Indian Ocean. Um, there hasn't been the resources dedicated to this ocean that we've seen um, in other ocean areas over the years. Um, and predominantly, that's because you know, developing nations, uh, who are the ones who have been pioneering the research in the ocean for, for decades and decades, um, haven't focused on it. I mean, the, uh, for many of those nations, the Atlantic or the Arctic, Antarctic or the Pacific have been um, areas of particular interest. And the Indian Ocean doesn't really have you know, those major nations which have been driving its, uh, its scientific research. Um, that's starting to change with the, the role that India has. Germany has been very... Uh, very um, active in research in, in, in the region as well, but it still remains the least researched, uh, the least understood ocean on our planet, um, despite covering 20% of the global ocean. Mm. But it's great to hear that there is some um, development into the right direction. And of course, with the work that you've been doing with, with Necton. Um, so I really hope, or I think we all really hope to see a change there in the, into the positive side. Thank you. I mean, we're just a uh, we're just a small part of it in many ways. What's going on? There's uh, a major project uh, launched by uh, UNESCO IOC over the last five now ten, extended for a further few years as well, called the International Indian Ocean Expedition Two, which is a series, an umbrella, if you like, of, of all sorts of different research organisations from around the world um, undertaking more and more research in the area. So. We hope it, uh, and with the decade as well, we hope um, you know, we're going to see a lot more research in this area to help gather the baseline data that we need to help inform the political, economic and legal decisions that need to be made if we're going to secure the future of uh, the lives and livelihoods of billions of people who rely on a healthy, resilient and prosperous ocean. Mm. 
Okay, um, you mentioned that the United Nations, they have now started the, the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And it's also kind of like the reason why we're talking here. So this uh, decade of the ocean, of course, as the name implies, it starts now in the year 2021, and it, uh, it will lead us all the way to uh, 2030. And one of the key missions throughout this decade of ocean science is to at least protect 30% of the world's ocean by 2030 through a network of so-called marine protected areas. Can you explain to us a little bit what are marine protected areas and why are they so important? So marine protected areas are areas which are set aside um, for no take zones. So there's very uh, little um, <clears throat> uh, exploitative impact on those regions. Um, and there are a range of different types of marine protected areas. Um, the ones which are most interesting to us um, and to the decade um, are likely to be those which are considered highly protected. So there is no take activity going on in those areas. Um, but there are a range of other ways in which um, uh, areas of ocean can also be considered as protected or as marine protected areas. But we particularly look at those highly protected areas of which at the moment it's two and a half, maybe three percent of highly protected areas. Um, and then you have big questions of enforcement around the rest of those other areas, whether they're just paper parks or, 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 or what. Um, and so, yeah, marine protected areas are, are fundamental to ensure the resilience and, and health and prosperity of, of the wider ocean. And how those areas are protected also relates to the areas which are not protected as well. So it's not just about having islands, if you like, or uh, in the sea which are protected. It's rather relating to the rest of those uh, area of ocean as well to see how they're sustainably managed. And that's a key part of the UN um, ocean, uh, decade of ocean science, which is around, a, uh, which is, yeah, focused on sustainability, really, and it's the sustainable management and governance of the ocean uh, and how science can support that, that, uh, uh, that, that result, that, um, that outcome that we all look for. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to fisheries, for example, if we look at something uh, specifically, uh, if you protect an area of ocean um, and that area has been designated because of its importance for fisheries, i.e. that it's, it provides nurseries and habitats for, for those fisheries, then... Um, what that enables is those fish stocks to be developed, to, um, to be healthy, and there's natural spillover um, uh, into those areas, which can then be, uh, then can be exploited, if they're exploited in a sustainable, manageable way. You know, it's all very well, as I said before, being able to protect little areas or quite large areas, but you need to ensure that the rest of the ocean around it is sustainably managed. So uh, fisheries is a key area as well. Another key outcome uh, on the sustainable development of the ocean is the the importance of marine protected areas for marine tourism so there was a very important oecd report which came out looking at the development of the blue economy uh, which said that uh, marine tourism by 2030 would be the single largest aspect of the blue economy uh, and sustainable marine tourism uh, needs a healthy resilient and, and uh, ocean around it uh, people don't want to go and see a dead dying ocean they want to see the brilliance and beauty of biodiversity and what a healthy ocean looks like so um, marine protected areas are critical for marine tourism, which is a, a key anchor of the blue economy. Mm. Um, one question to, to the first part of your answer. With, uh, you mentioned the fisheries as being one of the also key, yeah, key areas of, of work or that work that is needed to be done. Um, can you explain a little bit more, like, what do you mean when you say, like, uh, spillouts? So is it, is it like, can you imagine that you know you have a marine protected area and then just right, right outside of the, the edge of that area uh, is it really like that that there's like uh, boats waiting just to catch the fish that comes out of these marine protected areas um what do you think uh, yes i mean in part i think that is the case and that you and we saw that with the uh, the, uh, the chinese fleets around galapagos uh, last year uh, and the dramatic impact which they have. And they were circling the marine protected area around the Galapagos and uh, uh, a few hundred vessels out there were just hoovering up what was there. Um, and that's what, we, yeah, what you can see. You have these protected areas, but if, unless it's managed sustainably outside, then there's dramatic and devastating impact that can occur. Um, and so obviously, yeah, fish um, do, not, um, yeah, do not work to geographic boundaries. Of course they don't. They go wherever the hell they want. Um, yeah. And you have big pelagic fish as well that that can that can journey across vast distances of ocean. Um, and so, uh, what scientists look to do is try to understand where those critical nurseries and habitats are, um, and where uh, those yeah those fish are. 
those fish stocks are developing, um, and that's uh, often in it can be in shallower waters around uh, areas of very rich uh, biodiversity, such as reef ecosystems and other things. Um, others are around sea mounts as well, which are prolific for for for. for uh, for fishing um, and so we need to understand where those key areas are and so they can be protected and managed to support sustainable management of, of fisheries um, to support food security ultimately you know how it links back to us is ensuring food security if food security starts to tip over because you know three at least three billion people need fish as a primary source of protein if that starts to fall over because our fisheries are being unsustainably um, um, fished as they are um, throughout much of the world, then that becomes devastating for the food security of billions of people. Um, I'm curious, how does a area become a marine protected area? Can you like guide us just in short with the starting point of how research happens and like how do you pick out an area and uh, the timeline ish uh, until this area then actually becomes a marine protected area? Yeah, so I can speak really from you know, the experience of where we've been working in Seychelles, where yeah, it started with a, a government national commitment from the Seychelles to say we want to protect uh, 30% of our ocean, which is an area equivalent in size to uh, the area of, uh, of Germany, for instance. Um, wow. And they said that back in 2012, um, and then they created um, very innovative new blue finance solutions, blue bonds to help underpin the financing of this, uh, the development of these marine protected areas and the development of a sustainable blue economy. So it's not just looking at that 30 percent piece, but looking at uh, looking at the whole ocean, which for Seychelles is about 1.3, 1.4 million square kilometers. Um, and so they, the government of Seychelles worked with the Nature Conservancy, TNC, to put together what's called a marine spatial plan. So they can look at the whole ocean and understand where are those areas which are of critical importance um, for protection and where those areas are uh, can be designated for sustainable um, uh, management and exploitation. Uh, at that point, we need to obviously gather the baseline data to understand what's there uh, and how that should be protected. Um, and so when it came to, uh, say, shells, there was a big gap when it came to uh, knowledge, uh, baseline data of the deep sea. So what we see often in marine protected areas is that without that data set, uh, people make assumptions based on geophysical data that they may have. So they say, OK, well, based on what we know, we think this is going to be an important area to protect. But that's not really underpinned with or, or, or ground truth with scientific data itself. Um, yeah, okay. such as the biological diversity and other things which we look at. So we were invited by the government of Seychelles to undertake a, uh, a, a mission, uh, which is under the umbrella of First Descent. So we pulled together an alliance of different organisations to work together towards this outcome, where we worked with the government of Seychelles and uh, over 10 different partners from Seychelles to define what the goals, the objectives and everything needed to be, and then co deliver what that mission looked like. So very, at the heart of it was Seychelles, uh, scientists from Seychelles, um, conservationists, uh, political leaders and others. Um, so all outcomes are owned and vested within Seychelles, which is critical. All the data we generate is owned and vested by Seychelles. It's not us coming in and grabbing it and saying, we want this for our labs and our own research. That's not going to have the outcome. Also underpinning all of that is the democratization of science and those outcomes. So ensuring that the long term um, management is possible by investing in knowledge exchange or, or traditionally what's called capacity development. Um, so science, uh, scientists and ocean managers, uh, ocean policy makers, uh, fisheries experts uh, are all directly involved in developing uh, and delivering and owning the outcomes for the mission. So we gather the data, we pinpoint the key locations and from that we feed into the marine spatial plan. Uh, and out of that comes um, the the designation. So last year in March 2020, the president of Seychelles, uh, Danny Four, um, was able to sign the declaration that they have completed 30% uh, protection of um, of uh, Seychelles waters, territorial waters. And that's really just the first step, because then you need to move on to actually how you're going to effectively manage it, how you're going to enforce that, um, and and ensure that uh, it continues to provide the 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 underpinning of a healthy, resilient and prosperous ocean for Seychelles in the region. Mm. Yeah, that sounds all very uh, complicated and um, a lot of stakeholders yeah, I mean, I think, involved. Yeah, I mean, I think the starting point for all these things is political willing and political leadership. Um, and 
So those things can happen, yeah, can happen quicker. The marine protected areas can be established faster, um, where there is the political willing and where there is the finance, the investment, and the support of uh, national and international communities as as needed. Um, but you know, it's, it does take time. There's some hard yards that need to be put in from a scientific point of view to actually gather that data and make sure it's it's properly linked through to the marine spatial plan, through to knowledge exchange, through to public engagement to ensure there is the public support for political action um, and uh, and all the way through to the policy outcomes that you want to see. Um, so, yeah, there is we know how to do it, um, which is positive, but you need the political willing to get all the different stakeholders on, on side, um, not least the fisheries communities who can look at it and go, hold on a minute, you're going to be fishing, you're going to be preventing us from fishing in certain areas. That's going to undermine our livelihood, undermine our ability to feed ourselves in some places where there are artisanal fisheries. So, um, yeah, there is a critical piece of, uh, of, uh, of national stakeholder engagement for people to understand the, the long term value of sustainably managed fisheries to, in, to ensure local, uh, national, regional, international food security um, and, uh, and the sustainable development of their blue economies. And so you mentioned that Necton works, uh, for example, one of the missions or some of your missions, they, they base on the Seychelles, for example. I've also read that you've worked in the Maldives um, with your mission. Um, and now you mentioned like there, there needs to be like some sort of a political willingness and also like public engagement. Uh, with these two countries in mind, like how do you think that these two points, political willingness and uh, public engagement and public understanding has changed over the time that uh, you and Acton have been uh, active there and also other organizations uh, that have done work uh, towards marine protection of uh, protection of marine areas. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, you, we need public support for political action. You know, the politicians need that public mandate to act if they want to be able to put these things through. And yeah, you know, our work has just really begun in the Maldives, and we hope to undertake the field operation side, the actual, um, you know, the offshore research work that needs to go on later this year. Um, and yeah, all being well, um, the we will be able to undertake that mission. But when it comes to public engagement, it is, uh, yeah, it's, it's. Um, I mean, again, it starts with the political willingness, the political leadership, and that was in place and still is in place in, in Seychelles. They have a new government, a new administration from November last year, um, and the Maldives um, have a new leadership in place over the last couple of years. So that's where it really starts. Um, but then uh, you need to have the yeah the skills and expertise and leadership within the administration to be able to push it forward. Um, but then you have the stakeholder engagement. As, uh, it's, it's the fisheries communities, it's in schools, it's the local population and all those things. To, and you need to engage them and, and, and inspire them. And I think, you know, traditionally when it comes to public engagement, um, the majority of, uh, of news that we hear about the ocean tends to be negative. It's about, you know, the fish stocks are collapsing. It's going to undermine our food security. The impact of anthropogenic heat uh, on the ocean is... Uh, is devastating for, for corals and bleaching events, or it's carbon dioxide, our CO2 emissions uh, being absorbed into the ocean as carbonic acid, uh, increasing the acidification of the ocean, it's the dead zones of the ocean, on and on it goes. Um, and yes, we still need to do that. We need to bash people over the head and make them aware of the, the devastating impact which we are having uh, on our planet. Um, but we need to do that from a scientific base. And you know, a lot of oxygen uh, in these conversations has been taken uh, by plastic because there's a very sort of human link. We can all kind of re relate to it in one way. But plastic is just one part of the problem. It's, a, it's an issue of, of pollution. Uh, and there are many other pollutants which are having devastating impact on the ocean, whether that be heat, whether it be CO2, whether it be agricultural chemical runoff, on and on it goes. Plastic is one of them. And the bigger picture we need to be talking about is, is ocean health and resilience. And when we start to frame the bigger picture, we can start to see the need to engage people on a positive uh, narrative as well, that there is hope, that we are and we can and we should be on a journey towards a brighter future. Um, and what a healthy um, uh, ocean looks like is what we want to aim for. So... What we try to do is is um, is is encourage the the journalism about you know what would the, the dramatic impacts which humans are having on the sea, but ensuring that we're relating it back to people at every point along the way because otherwise it's very difficult yeah. for people to relate to what's on the ocean, but also to give people hope. You know, Martin Luther King didn't say I have a nightmare. He said I've got a I want to I have a dream, and that's what we need to give people. So. We that's hope it. our journey of um, of scientific exploration and, and uh, conservation 
is a story which uh, appeals to people. It's a story of, uh, of, of human endeavor to, to try and um, build the planetary resilience that we need. So we need as a community to become better storytellers, I think, and find ways to engage and inspire people about uh, the need for action. Uh, because ultimately, I think long term, that's where change really occurs. If, if it's motivated from a position of hope, from a position of of um, resilience um, and belief that there is a better future ahead for all of us. That's so true. I think that's, uh, yeah, that's really the point to make those, uh, I mean, it's, it's very, um, it's a very scientific topic. It's very like hard, I think, for the, the regular person to also understand all these interconnections and how everything kind of, you know, feeds off to each other. Uh, what would you say were like your personal or in the, from the eyes of, of Nexon, what were the milestones that you guys uh, managed to do in 2020 uh, last year? And uh, with that in mind, like, what are your goals for this year, 2021? Um, <clears throat> very good question. It was a very difficult year for, for many of us um, and very disappointing that we had to postpone our, our mission uh, in the Maldives uh, last year. So I think the, yeah, the major goals for us in 2020 was being able to support the implementation of the Marine Protected Area uh, Program, the Marine Spatial Plan in Seychelles, uh, which is ongoing, a major symposium we had with, uh, with our, uh, our partners and colleagues in Seychelles, which was virtual, of course. Um, so um, a lot of our focus has been around uh, accelerating the scientific analysis to ensure that we can support those activities. Um, so that was a uh, yeah the major sort of focus for us. I think um, in other areas, we, our data program Octopus, which is the ocean data portal, was utilised by the United Nations. Um, uh, one of the blue papers on marine biodiversity and critical habitats to understand where there is life on the ocean and what that data can tell us about the policies uh, that need to be put in place for effective management. Um, so <clears throat> there have been um, a number of different uh, yeah, projects and initiatives which we've been working on. Um, I think you know, one of the key areas for us in 2020 was also to, to help support knowledge exchange uh, in the region um, and to in ensure, uh, do what we can to help that development in the Indian Ocean. Um, and, and that's one of our major goals uh, this year in 2021, uh, to kick off a new um, uh, knowledge exchange program with WIOMSA, the Western Indian Ocean Marine Sciences um, Association. Um, we also have our missions the end of next year as well, um, which will be in the Maldives and then uh, potentially in the high seas. Um, and uh, so being back on the front foot with our field operations is going to be very key. We have uh, two major science initiatives, which we're launching next year as well. One is around microplastics and the prevalence of microplastics and distribution uh, globally. Um, which relates to yeah, the, the data and the samples which we were able to collect on a, on a mission we participated in the Weddell Sea the um, uh, year before last. Uh, and also looking at deep reefs um, as a, a conservation priority, because often these deep reefs in, in yeah, uh, beyond the sort of the shallower reefs, which people are most often aware of, they're not really considered as part of those marine protected areas. And they need to be. They're areas of high biodiversity. So there's a big research piece that we want to do around there. Um, I think the bigger picture of 2021 is around, you know, the ocean super year. You know, there are going to be major decisions made um, in COP26 uh, at the G7 um, and uh, the Convention of Biological Diversity and other things where, you know, those decisions will inform the, the future of our ocean and our planet for decades to come. So we all need to be aware of that. We all need to know what we can do in this regard as individual citizens. And we need to be active citizens for, for the ocean and for the planet. Uh, and... Um, one of the areas we're, we're working on to help that is going to be a new ocean podcast, which is uh, kicking off um, uh, uh, this year. Um, and that's it's an ocean podcast, which is for those who love the sea. You know, it's not about preaching conservation or things like that. There are those themes which come through. But we want to tell great stories about the sea. We want to inspire people outside of the choir, outside of the usual sort of conservation scientific community. We, get people inspired by the ocean, inspired by what needs to happen, what we can do and, and understand that we all can make a difference. Um, but that starts from having a love of the sea. You know, we, we don't protect what we don't love. So with this new podcast, we hope we'll inspire people to love the sea a little bit more. It sounds like you have a fully uh, scheduled next uh, year, uh, a lot of stuff on your plate. 
Uh, yes, it's going to be a big year, um, and we're also another thing that we're going to be uh, developing is a is a regional a regional initiative um, around uh, how we can support the sustainable governance of the Western and Central Indian Ocean with a spatial target of thirty by thirty. It's 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 all well and good. We've got that political leadership, that national leadership with Seychelles and the Maldives, but we need to see how that can translate. Uh, wider, so engaging with uh, other nations in the region to see you know, what is a strategy, what are the needs and priorities there, uh, led and owned by those nations to create a new strategy that can be hopefully ratified in the coming years to support the sustainable management and governance of the ocean with that key spatial target of 30 by 30. You mentioned that um, also one of your uh, tasks and now the last thing you mentioned with the podcast is to you know, inspire people, what we also talked about in the last couple of minutes. Um, do you have any practical tips for, for the listeners now um, or people reading about these interviews later, um, how they can contribute to a healthier ocean, how they could contribute to your work with Necton? Is there anything that people can do maybe from their homes now with the corona uh, pandemic still, still going on outside? Uh, any tips you have? Yes, I mean, I think very simply, you know, any action uh, is driven by our individual passions. And the more we can uh, find ways to be passionate about the subject, the more we can individually learn about it and, and understand the science behind it critically, um, the more informed we're going to be to be able to make uh, those key decisions as citizens, active citizens, decisions that we make with our, our shopping basket where we buy our fish. You know, I think, yeah, the, the most critical thing we should be looking at is fishing at the moment because it's fishing is the single most devastating uh, impact that we're having on the ocean uh, unsustainable wow. fishing um, and right now you know in terms of the urgency and the immediacy of the impact that is the thing which is causing the most dramatic impact on our sea and we can make a decision every single day um, by what fish we buy and how we buy our fish Uh, and support those who are, uh, are fishing in a sustainable way because it's not we're not here to say don't fish and don't eat fish some people might want to do that and that's up to them but for those who do eat fish there is a way to ensure that you are supporting those who are doing it in a sustainably managed way and those which aren't um, also to look at your yeah you know, the political system behind it because a lot of the deep sea trawling and deep sea fishing that's going on is only uh, able to occur because of government subsidies um, and so Yeah, if you really want to get on the front foot, look into that, find out more. There's great, there's lots of sites around that will inform you what you need to do and, and write to your, yeah, your political leaders who are appointed by you, you know, it's, um, and, uh, and that's where it needs to, to be. And I think, um, yeah, the ocean uh, outside, um, outside exclusive economic zones, which is 200 miles offshore, is the collective commons. And under the UN law of the sea, that means it's owned by you and I, it's owned by the people of the planet. And people are devastating that collective commons um, and they're, they're being and that's able to occur because our governments around the world are subsidizing their ability to destroy our planet destroy the wow. resilience that our that our ocean needs to support us so if you care about if you care about food security if you care about breathing oxygen or when half of our oxygen comes out um, you care about um, the impact that we're having then we need to get on to our politicians and we need to make our voices heard so I think anyone watching, anyone listening, two things you can do. One is look at your shopping basket and learn how to shop uh, for your fish in a sustainable manner. And the other thing is get onto your politicians and, and, uh, and, and direct action towards them to make sure they're doing the responsible thing. Because sometimes they might not actually know, sometimes they do and they need to be held to account. Those are some awesome tips. I will keep them in mind as well, <laughs> for sure. Uh, one last question. Um, so, I mean, with the job that you do and with all the work you do, of course, you kind of need to have uh, optimism about the future of the ocean. I mean, that's kind of the driving force behind what we all do. Um, can you pinpoint like something in specific or anything that comes to your mind? Like, is there one thing that really makes you optimistic for the, for the ocean and the ocean's future? Yes. I mean, I think with just the work which we've been doing, working with and on behalf of, uh, of the government and the people of Seychelles um, is evidence that it is possible. Um, there is a nation uh, of a population of 100,000 in the middle of the Indian Ocean, uh, one of the last populated islands on our, on, on our entire planet. Um, 
And yet they have found a way to protect 30% of their ocean, an area the size of Germany, to put in a sustainable blue uh, economy um, in place and to develop it. Um, and if they can do it, if a small um, African nation, a large ocean nation, but a small population can achieve something so extraordinary as they did last year with President Ford signing in 30% protection of their territorial waters, they are a beacon of hope for all of us. Um, and they're also a bellwether for our success and that they, yeah, there, there lies an opportunity and it shows what is possible where there is political willing, where there is uh, the economic, the scientific, um, the environmental and the legal case for why it works um, and why it is critical for not just ocean resilience uh, and ocean health, but planetary health, um, because our ocean regulates our planet's chemistry, it regulates our planet's climate. Without it, you know, we know what's happening. Uh, we are hitting these tipping points. We're going to continue to hit them. But we must have hope. We must have optimism. We must believe there is another pathway. And we need to hit this target of 30 by 30. If we don't, then my optimism will uh, reduce significantly. Because at that point, we're probably moving into a position away from, you know, building that resilience into, a, into survival. You know, at that point, we're, yeah people are going to start being making some really tough decisions they're going to be playing god more and more what lives what dies how do we keep as much as we can based on the destructive impact of those devastating tipping points which we are already hitting so um but we have hope this is the ocean this is the decade of ocean science for uh, for sustainable development so Let's work towards that goal with hope, with vision, with inspiration um, and passion and, and do whatever we can as citizens of this planet, as citizens of our families and communities and uh, of our nations to try and make the world a better place. We can, we must, we have no option. Perfect. Thank you so much, Oliver. And thank Mark you so much for all the work you do and for the work Nectar Mission does. And uh, we as Parallel super excited to follow you also into the next year and to, uh, yeah, also talk about your stories to our uh, audience and really get that message out there that there is time. We have 10 years now and uh, let's, let's do what we can. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. And I think, you know, the work which you're doing at Parallels is so critical because we've talked a lot about being able to tell the story, being able to have eyes on the ocean, but so much of the ocean is out of sight and out of mind. But your cameras are fundamental to our ability to go and document what's down there, to be able to tell the story of what's in our ocean and to bring it to life. So it's not out of sight and out of mind. And that is the power of Parallels in my mind, to be able to take, make sure the ocean isn't out of sight and out of mind and we can put it on the public stage, in the public consciousness. So you need to keep doing your work as best you can. Scale up. We need millions of your cameras. We need them in the hands of scientists of divers, of politicians, of comedians, whoever it is, they need your cameras. So we're delighted to partner with you and uh, keep up the good work and uh, we look forward to working with you in the years ahead. Perfect, thanks Oliver. My, my pleasure, take care.